Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. Lots of news coming in this week, thanks to EFA 2018, which is currently happening over in Germany, where we've seen a ton of new laptops and displays launch. On top of that, though, this week we did hear about Global Foundries ending plans to offer 7 nanometer manufacturing, so a fair few topics to cover. Let's get right into them. First story of the week, Intel launched a new selection of CPUs, but don't get too excited because they're not new 9th gen desktop CPUs like the long awaited 8 core Core i9 9900K. Instead, Intel strangely released a new selection of 8th gen mobile parts codenamed Whiskey Lake U and Amber Lake Y. I'm not entirely sure why these are 8th gen CPUs when it seems Intel will be rolling out 9th gen shortly, but here we are, a year after KB Lake Refresh launched as 8th gen, we have Whiskey Lake also as 8th gen, so fun times. Not a whole lot of interesting stuff to say here to be honest, these new CPUs improve upon their predecessors by offering native USB 3.1 support and an integrated 802.11ac controller. As for actual SKUs, let's first go through Whiskey Lake U. These are 15 watt parts like KB Lake Refresh U were previously, and we're still getting 4 core 8 thread Core i5 and Core i7 CPUs along with 2 core 4 thread Core i3s. The only real difference is a slight bump to clock speeds. The Core i7-8565U has a base clock of 1.8 GHz and a boost of 4.6 GHz, so that's up from the 1.8 GHz base and 4.0 GHz boost of the existing KB Lake Refresh Core i7-8550U. You get similar bumps with the Core i5-8265U and the Core i3-8145U. Graphics and cache are the same as before. As far as Amber Lake is concerned, these are the first 8th gen Y series parts, so they pack a 5 watt TDP. Originally, the plan was to have 10 nanometer Cannon Lake as Y series parts, but due to delays and issues, that never really eventuated. So, what we have instead are Amber Lake, which are three two core, four thread CPUs with UHD 615 graphics. But don't get excited for anything new, these are again just basic clock speed boost to older 7th gen KB Lake parts. The Core i7-8500Y for example jumps up to a 1.5GHz base and 4.2GHz boost clock, compared to a 1.3GHz base and 3.6GHz boost for the Core i7-7Y75. It's again similar for the Core i5-8200Y and Core M3-8100Y. Getting these sorts of minor clock speed bumps within the same TDP rating is always nice, but we'll have to wait and see whether there is any real world difference in things like sustained clock speeds and actual power draw compared to existing parts. Still, these new Whiskey Lake and Amber Lake parts will slot into systems that previously used either KB Lake Refresh or KB Lake Y quite nicely. And as you might expect, whenever there is a new mobile CPU launch from Intel, we get a range of new laptops from all the major vendors. I'm not going to go through everything in detail, but if you are after a new laptop, there are plenty of decent looking options from companies like Dell, Lenovo, Acer, and Asus. Dell, for example, launched a new XPS 13 2-in-1 that includes Intel's new Amber Lake Y processors, giving a minor CPU upgrade. They also launched a cheaper XPS 13 configuration with the Core i3-8130U for just $900. Acer launched the lightest ever 15-inch notebook, the Swift 5, at just 990 grams, which packs a Whiskey Lake CPU and will be available in January for $1,100. Acer also launched the 14-inch Swift 3 with Whiskey Lake and an MX150 starting at $800. From a we have the ZenBook 13, 14, and 15, which use Intel's new CPUs, and up to a GTX 1050 Max-Q GPU in slim bodies with new expansive slim bezel displays. Lenovo here, a bit of a strange launch from them. They launched a new yoga book that bizarrely is using 7th gen Y series parts rather than 8th gen. And yeah, probably won't talk any more about these new systems. Perhaps the biggest story to break this week, Global Foundries has announced they are ending the development of their 7 nanometer fabrication process. The company has stopped all work on 7 nanometers, will not produce 7 nanometer chips for any customers, and will instead focus on specialized process technologies for clients in emerging high growth markets, at least that's in Anantec's own words. And as far as that stuff is concerned, we're talking more about 14 and 12 nanometer stuff for RF customers and so forth, rather than cutting edge 7 nanometer tech. This news surprised most of us considering the enormous cost of developing a new process node. It's not something you simply decide to stop working on at the drop of a hat. Instead, this is a massive strategy shift for global foundries, and ending all development on 7 nanometers will likely cost them billions of dollars, especially considering the node was set to be ready in the fourth quarter of this year. The company even confirmed the decision to stop work on 7 nanometers 
was not based on technical issues, but rather ongoing financial concerns. Perhaps there were simply not enough customers interested in their 7 nanometer node. I mean, it's really hard to say at this point. In cancelling 7 nanometers, Global Foundries also can work on 5 nanometer and 3 nanometer research and development, so it's clear the company isn't interested in being a cutting edge fabrication facility anymore. An Antex article goes into more depth on what Global Foundries will be providing moving forward, but it's definitely disappointing to see the number of leading edge fabs drop down to just two. Samsung and TSMC will be the only remaining ones that provide, I guess, their services to other parties. And then of course there's Intel if you want to count them as well. As for the major PC chip manufacturers, AMD was one of Global Foundry's biggest customers. The two companies worked together for both CPUs such as Ryzen and GPUs like Vega, and those were on Global Foundry's 12 nanometer and 14 nanometer nodes. However, moving forward, AMD will shift to using TSMC for CPU and GPU manufacturing, and it seems this has been in the works for some time, so it shouldn't be a massive hindrance for AMD. You know, existing projects like 7 nanometer Vega and 7 nanometer Epic were already set to use TSMC's process tech. Basically, this is just a confirmation that other 7 nanometer projects will be using TSMC as well. Again, I don't expect that to impact them too much. NVIDIA, of course, they've been a TSMC customer for some time, so this Global Foundry's news doesn't impact them whatsoever. While Intel, again, they use their own fabs and they are having their own set of issues moving to their equivalent 10 nanometer node. So yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with Global Foundries moving forward. And I think TSMC will certainly continue to cement themselves as the biggest uh, third party fabrication facility out there. A couple of interesting new monitors have launched at EFA from Acer and Samsung. We'll start with the Acer offerings. First up is the Acer Predator XB273K, and that's a 27 inch 4K IPS monitor with a maximum 144Hz refresh rate and G Sync support. We're also getting HDR support certified for display HDR 400 with 400 nits of peak brightness and 90% DCI P3 coverage. But you shouldn't confuse the Predator XB273K for the Predator X27. The X27 is Acer's flagship HDR monitor with a thousand nits of peak brightness and a 384 zone local dimming backlight. The XB273K appears to ditch the fancy backlight for a more traditional one without local dimming, while also ditching the quantum dot film, which shaves the price down from $2,000 to just $1,300 when it's released in Q4. Acer also unveiled a collection of new high end nitro monitors. The Nitro XV273K is basically a free sync version of the Pre Predator XB273K, and it'll cost $900, so a decent $400 cheaper than the G-Sync equivalent. There's also the 27-inch Nitro XV272U, which is a 27-inch 1440p IPS panel at 144Hz, likely without HDR for $500. And then there's the Nitro XF272U, a TN version of the XV272U for $450. Samsung also announced some new ultra-wide monitors. The C34J791 is a 34-inch 3440x1440 VA panel at 100Hz with FreeSync, a 1500R curve and 125% sRGB coverage with Quantum Dot. It has a Thunderbolt 3 input in addition to DisplayPort and HDMI and will cost about €880. Euros. The C43J89 is a 43-inch 3840x1200 VA panel at 120Hz with an 1800R curve and the C49J890 is a 49 inch 3840 by 1080 VA panel at 144Hz, also with an 1800R curve. The 49 inch model will also cost around 900 euros. Lots of numbers and letters there to get through. I can't believe I made through that in just one take. Um, on the show floor, AU Optronics showed off their new 32 inch 4K 144Hz HDR panel with multi zone backlighting. That will be coming to monitors shortly as a larger equivalent to existing displays like the PG27UQ. News also broke that NVIDIA's big format gaming displays have been delayed to Q1 2019. The BFGDs are basically high-end 65-inch TVs with HDR, G-Sync, at least a thousand nits of brightness, DCI P3 coverage, and so forth. They're also set to cost between 4,000 and 5,000 euros, which is right up there with the prices of high-end OLED TVs, so you'd hope the picture quality is stunning. 
What else have we got here? I guess uh, Battlefield 5, that's been delayed until November 20th. The game was originally set to come out on October 19th, but DICE apparently wanted to make some meaningful improvements to the core gameplay experience based on feedback from the closed alpha. So it's been delayed. UL are developing a new 3D mark test that will utilize ray tracing, specifically Microsoft's DirectX ray tracing, which technologies like NVIDIA RTX then utilize. It'll be a new separate test to existing tests like Firestrike and TimeSpy, and apparently it should be ready for the launch of NVIDIA's new GPUs around September 20th. Final story of this week, Jim Anderson has departed AMD's Computing and Graphics Group, where he was Senior Vice President and General Manager, and he'll be joining Lattice Semiconductor as CEO. Anderson will join Lattice on September 4th, having joined AMD in June 2015. Lattice make programmable logic devices like FPGAs, just in case you were wondering. That's it for this week's News Corner. Plenty of interesting stuff going on, and I expect next month will be even more hectic with launches from NVIDIA and perhaps more launches from Intel. Fun stuff. Anyway, if you like this segment, subscribe to Hardware Unbox and hit that bell icon so YouTube sends it to you directly every Friday. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord chat, and I'll catch you in the next one.